Our gospel for today comes from Luke 14, verses 25 to 33. It's on page 59 in your New Testament if you'd like to follow along. And I know that you've been saying the word of God, word of life, so we're going to try to keep that going and see how it goes. Uh, feel free to, to, to not boo after the gospel if you don't like it, but we can talk about that. Here's the good news for this day. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Savior and friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As I was nearing the end of the sabbatical, I knew what I wanted to say. I knew the sermon that I wanted to preach, even though I hadn't written it yet. I didn't know what the gospel text uh, would be, but I hoped that it would somewhat fit in with what I felt I needed to share uh, after everything that happened this summer. I'll admit, I got a little worried that it might be some super random gospel text, and it seemed bad when it started out. Telling people to hate their fathers, their mothers, their wives, their husbands, their children, life itself, that doesn't seem like the best way to come back from sabbatical. <laughs> But reading through the whole gospel, the one picked for this week by uh, the lectionary compilers over 30 years ago, I don't know that I could have handpicked a better gospel text than this one. I shouldn't be surprised. Not after what I experienced of God in Assisi, Italy. Assisi is an important place. I was going to say Assisi is an important place to me, but I think it's much more than that. It's an important place, period. It's a thin place, a place defined within Celtic uh, practices as an area where the line between this world and the next is thin, paper thin, where you can almost reach out with your hands and touch the very <clears throat> mysteries of God that are right there waiting for you. This is a CZ to a T. If you've ever wanted to feel God, see God, touch God, experience God, I don't know that there is a better place to go to than a CZ Italy. The town just feels different, is different. And whenever I'm there, the impossible happens over and over again. I first heard God speak to me in this easy 20 years ago now. And for lack of a better way of putting it, God would not shut up the entire time I was in this easy. 
I'm not going to get into everything that happened right here in this sermon because uh, I imagine if I went on for hours and hours, you'd boo um, or throw things. But I want to tell you two jaw-dropping events. After I tell you what I saw, what I experienced, you may feel that Pastor Adrian needs to go have his head checked out. And if you want to send me on another spat, um, <laughs> you might be right. But I know what I saw. And we are people of faith. A people that hold highest that which is most unseen. A people that believe that the God that made everything is daily walking alongside us. If you don't believe me, then I don't know who will. Man, the internet is being weird. What did you do to the internet while I was gone? <laughs> there are two basilicas in Assisi. Another word for big church. We can get into the differences of it, but just big churches. Um, the one that holds the tomb of St. Francis and the one that holds the tomb of St. Clair. For the first story, uh, I was at St. Clair's Basilica. I was in the side chapel. The side chapel is rather famous uh, because of this cross, the San Damiano cross. It's a cross that supposedly talked directly to St. Francis. The story goes uh, that before the cross, Francis would pray uh, every day, every night, that the light would remove the darkness within his mind. And as he looked up at the cross one day, he saw the lips of Christ move. And he heard the words, Francis, you see that my house is falling down. Go and repair it for me. And Francis answered simply, willingly. <coughs> it was this cross that sent St. Francis on his lifelong quest to fix the church. Not just a church, but the church with a capital C. I closed my eyes, sitting in front of this cross. There's a pew, there's kneelers. There really wasn't anyone around me. I think there was a church service going on in the main hall, but I was mostly by myself in this room. And I started to pray. I don't know what made me say it, and I don't know what I was hoping to accomplish if the prayer was answered. But I said, Jesus, I want to see you. And at that moment, with my eyes still closed, I saw Jesus drag a cross in front of my vision. Ever had your eyes closed and you see the silhouette of somebody as they pass by? It was that, but with a man dragging a cross behind me. I popped my eyes open to see if Maybe someone had just walked in front of me carrying like a ladder or something. There was no, I was, there was nothing up there. Nothing in front of me that could have been there. I was alone, but I wasn't. I had seen Jesus walk in front of me. Our gospel for today says quite simply, I'm just too far away from here. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Did I mention that this uh, passage is perfect for today? That exact line ran through my head as I dwelled in the after image of seeing Jesus walk in front of me. A question formed in my mind that is the question that every Christian is supposed to ask. What is my particular cross to carry? Jesus is not calling all of us to an execution. He's not calling all of us to die for someone in a literal sense. Jesus came to this world to set us free. That was his calling. That was his cross, and he carried it better than anyone that has ever lived. We are called to ask ourselves, why have we come to this world? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? What is our cross to carry? Sorry about this. <laughs> that brings me to the second story. Probably the less believable of the two stories, and that's probably saying something. 
But for this one, I was in the uh, Basilica of St. Francis. <coughs> no. I'll be sitting out there with you soon. something different on this day. I wanted to experience this area, this holy place, in a new way, so I faced basically what was a, a concrete wall where I assumed St. Francis's head was pointing, uh, but it could be his feet. I never looked into it. <coughs> but I sat there, eyes closed, uh, wondering about that question, what is my cross? But I turned that question over. The idea of a cross, even as a pastor of a Christian denomination, is a little outside my experience. I mean, I see crosses on people's necks, but I don't experience the cross execution in real life. I uh, thank God. So what my question became is, God, what are you calling me to do next? And then I saw it. Before, what I was seeing was basically the shadow of Jesus walking across my vision. What I saw in the tomb of St. Francis was a movie. I was seeing Jesus from the top down, and he was struggling. Huge stone walls were pressed into his side, and he was struggling upward, trying to get me, trying to break themselves free like he was in a stone prison. I've never seen anything like this. I know it's probably a struggle to believe that I saw it, but that level of detail, that level of meaning. Jesus was being trapped, and the call was being sent out that he needed to be let out. Do you get why I say that it's easy as a thin place? I get the next slide, Carl. If we think about it, if we try to make a list of the things that have trapped Jesus in our world. That's probably a nearly endless list, right? We have our usual greed and pride, the, the things that stop us from letting God into our lives because we think we are God. There's, of course, things like addiction, heartache, that can make us feel like we are blocked off from God, that we are undeserving or that God is too far off. But in thinking about what we do to trap Jesus in our world, as I am a pastor, this is me that saw it. As I was sitting there, I was thinking about what we have done to Christianity today. The ways that we've trapped Jesus in our war of religion. Christianity is at war. I hear this all the time. And it's true, but for the most part, it's not a war from the outside. It's a war from within. We can only help these kinds of people. We can only talk to these kinds of people. We can only believe this. Only these people can be leaders. Church is only like this. We can only say that. Can't, can't, can't. As I was reading the gospel for today, that perfect gospel, something hit me. We have turned 
Jesus into a possession. Here are the words from Jesus for the gospel reading, which sounds harsh from the get-go. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yet even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. My Jesus wouldn't do that. My Jesus wouldn't say that. The Jesus I believe in would never. But there's not some Jesus that we can invent. There's not some Jesus that we can make into our own image. As I was reminded in Assisi, there is only the actual Jesus that is literally still walking around with us in this world bringing hope and peace and meaning to every individual life unless we stand in the way. That humble carpenter that welcomed all to his table, that saw everyone, even the poorest of the poor, as valuable, the Son of God that chose to die for his friends, for you, for me, for everyone. We can't own him. others to walk with them. Move the walls that are standing in their way so that they can get in deeper relationship with this person that is actually there, here with us now. We need to take away the walls that we've built around our God, our Jesus, and let him be the Jesus, the God of this world and of our life. Everything changes when we do that. When we allow God to be God again. Here's the last part of our gospel. So therefore, none of you can become my disciples if you do not give up all your possessions. <coughs> that includes the God we have trapped in our camp. That includes the hang-ups we keep about who belongs and who does not. These lines about hating family, even life itself, and unloading all of your possessions are not really about hating someone and not really about what stuff you have around you. But instead, they're about the things that hold us back from taking up our cross and setting people free from turning this whole world into thin places where all can see the grace and mercy and love of God. It's there, right in front of them. God is real. Jesus loves you. It's good to be back. Amen.